Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to today's joint MDB session on Just Transition. My name is Sean Bradley. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at Chatham House and I've had the pleasure of working with EBRD and the MDB group on the issue of Just Transition uh, for the past 18 months. So I'm delighted to be moderating today's session uh, and introducing such an impressive lineup of speakers. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so we'll get straight into it. And to kick us off, I would like to welcome Chris Hurst, the Director General of the Projects Directorate at the European Investment Bank, uh, who will offer some introductory remarks to today's session. Chris, the floor is yours. Good, good morning, uh, everybody. Well, good afternoon, I guess it is now. And, um, and thank you for attending this, this, this session. Um, of course, I'm preaching to the converted here when I say we, we have a, a, a climate crisis, but it is good that we just remind ourselves what we need to do, and we need to replace the capital stock we have today in the next 20 years or so, and we also have to invest in, in climate adap adaptation. And the, the key point is that this is going to affect different people differently. I mean, some, some, some investment will be needed more in some places and less, and less, uh, less, less in others. And it, in fact, a key part of the, of the Paris Agreement and of the, and, and of the negotiations that are taking place here today is how to make that process equitable. How do we have a just, a just transition? Um, equitable across nations, a key part of the discussion here, but also equitable within nations. In fact, in the European Union, I come from the EIB, which is the EU bank, in the European Union, we do have specific issues around regions that are heavily dependent on coal and have to move out of coal. And we know, in fact, from the experiences not far from here, in the north of England, that that can be a very difficult process uh, and cause considerable social unrest and great difficulty for, for communities that are, are, are dependent on, on, on fossil, fossil fuels. Um, so the, a key policy issue that we have is to assure that as we go forward we don't have any trade-offs between SDGs on the one hand and climate action and, and dealing with the climate crisis uh, on the other. The, the MDBs clearly have a role to play here. We have a role in sharing knowledge on the subject and we have a role on, on um, providing finance. Now as a group the MDBs have been working together uh, for, for a considerable period now to develop a set of principles to deal with, 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 uh, deal with this problem, a set of principles around the just transition. Uh, and in fact, this meeting is, concludes the first step that we have, uh, that we have in, in concluding this, this set of principles that, that we have. Principles that focus on, on uh, equitable growth and, and sustainable development, principles that, that, that focus on the support of the move away from, from intensive industries, uh, greenhouse gas intensive industries, support to PPPs to mobilize the private sector to, 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 this, the, to, to this problem, and the coordination and planning uh, to, so that this can be done in the most effective way possible, and indeed including stakeholders in this process. This work has been led by the EBID since the COP25, and I'd like to thank them for their, for their, for their efforts to, 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 to take this, this, this work uh, forward. And in fact, I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Harry, from the EBID now, who I believe is going to take over from that. Is that correct? Um, that's that is correct, Chris. Okay. Thank you for setting the context so clearly. And uh, exactly, we will turn now to Harry Boyd Carpenter, who is the Managing Director of Green Economy Transition and Climate Action, EBRD, uh, for our keynote presentation on uh, the Just Transition work that the MDB uh, Paris Climate Working Group has been undertaking. Harry, over to you. Thank you very much, Sean, and, uh, and thank you, Chris. And I should say right from the outset, this is a, a very much a joint MDB uh, effort. I mean, we, we have a very big problem to solve. We only solve it together and in partnership. Um, the other thing that struck me actually walking in this morning is um, that Glasgow is actually a pretty good city to be talking about just transition because this is a city which has gone through its own transition. It's a city which made its fortune and made its economy off the back of manufacturing, off shipbuilding, at one point making I think a, a quarter of the locomotives in the entire world. But that industry you know, moved away and it had to find a different economic model including the, the exhibition centre which we're sitting in now. So, Glasgow is a, is a, sends a message that a just transition is possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. 
Um, I think now I have some slides that, that should be coming to, on the screen. So as you can see from the very first slide, from all of the logos in the bottom right, this is truly a joint MDB effort. Um, and I'll start by just giving a very brief overview of the work around Just Transition, and especially the high-level principles that we have been developing in the last year or so. So the starting point for the joint MDB work is the high-level statement at the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Summit in September 2019. But of course, that in its turn builds on the Paris Agreement and the recognition within the Paris Agreement that just transition is absolutely fundamental to any low-carbon transition. And the, and the Secretary General's statement said that each of our institutions will take actions to help clients move away from the use of fossil fuels and committed us to develop by COP26, i.e. this COP, financing and policy strategies to support that just transition. And so in the course of the last year or so, there's been a joint MDB working group that has undertaken a whole series of research and dialogue activities, talking to stakeholders across the sectors and across the countries you work in. And what we've come away with from that is that first we need a set of high-level principles. We need to have some guidelines, some rules that govern our work. And second, we need to deploy the full range of our activities. MDBs are banks. So money, investing, lending is at the heart of what we do. But we're also development banks, and, and we do a lot more than that. Um, we do a lot of policy engagement. We talk to our countries of operation. We talk to the stakeholders. We talk to investors. We talk to affected communities. And we also are a vehicle for providing technical assistance and donor finance. And we need that full range of tools. Just Transition is not simply a financing challenge. It's not simply a policy or advice challenge. It's a challenge that requires all of that toolkit to address. And that is really where the MDBs think that we have our particular role to play, to act as that nexus, that interface between these many different constituencies and these many different tools. So we have three main areas that we're focusing on now. The first is to have this common understanding, to have this, to have this uh, high level principles. And we have those now and I'll talk through them very, very briefly in the, in, on the next slide. The second thing though is to operationalize things. Um, we can't just sit there and talk, we can't just develop principles. Principles aren't really going to help people on the ground. What we need is practical action. And I think that, that's what we can start to talk about now, but what I really hope is that at COP27 we will have a session that is focused on really showcasing the, the practical steps that we're taking and the actions that we're taking. And then the third area is to explore some of the networks and partnerships, because again, this is a question of partnership. This is a question of mobilizing many different actors, and you see that range of actors in, in the people joining us today on the panel. Um, how do we mobilize all of us together to share knowledge, work out who is best placed to work on which issue? So if I turn now to the principles themselves, uh, if I can have the next slide, I think going in the other direction. If I have the, the slide after this one, perfect, the principles, okay. So principle one sets out our aims, which are to, of course to deliver a climate objective. We know what we need to do. We need to hold the temperature rise to 1.5, uh, we need to do that by getting global emissions to net zero by 2050 and halve them by 2030. And we know that exiting from very carbon intensive industries, in particular, but not exclusively the coal industry, is absolutely fundamental to that. But we also need to do that in a way that ensures socioeconomic outcomes are sustainable and acceptable and don't leave people behind. And we need to do that in a way that's consistent with the sustainable development goals. So principle one sets out those aims, reconciling climate objectives with development goals. Principle two identifies the tools we'll use. And it's the tools that I mentioned earlier, financing, policy engagement, technical advice. Principle three links what we're doing into a broader strategic support. A just transition is a concept that has to be embedded across all of our sector strategies. When we think about energy and, have, and set an energy strategy, or engage with a country on their energy strategy, we need to be embedding the concept of a just transition. The same when we talk about transport, the same when we talk about economy-wide uh, low-carbon pathways. We have to have the concept of just transition deeply embedded in those strategies and that work. Principle four sets out the, the focus and the priority in this activity. And that's really around mitigating the negative socioeconomic impacts. The fact remains that we have economic, eco economies built on the consumption of carbon. More than 80% of, uh, of, of, of energy supply for a modern economy comes from hydrocarbons. And we know that shifting away from that, 
will have very significant socio-economic impacts on the communities that rely on those industries. And unless we mitigate those, we will not have either a sustainable or a fair transition. So that means that we need to assist workers, communities, regions, and we need to make sure above all that there is access to employment, to, structural to, to sustainable and inclusive jobs and livelihoods for those communities which currently rely on high carbon activities. And finally, we emphasize the process in principle five. We emphasize that our engagement with Just Transition has to be rooted in transparent and inclusive engagement with stakeholders. This can't be something imposed, let alone by MDBs, but even by governments. It has to be something that builds genuine community engagement and support. So these principles set out the agenda for our work, and they provide the frame of reference. But as I said before, principles alone are not what we need. We need to turn this into activity. That'll be the focus in the coming year. And that will include an efforts to integrate this into the green recovery post-COVID uh, economic processes. But I want to turn now just to give an indication of where we're already starting to take action. If I can have the next slide. So there are just a few activities highlighted here. Um, across the MDBs, we've identified 20 activities in 2020, um, spilling over now into 2021. As I say, at COP27, I hope we'll be showcasing many more. But let me give a few examples. In some cases, we've been able to focus now on repurposing old co legacy coal assets for renewable energy. That's something the World Bank in particular has been very focused on. It's something that we at EBRD have been able to do in, in Greece and in, in North Macedonia. Um, we're also focused on the plan. We know that to, get you, to navigate your way through a low carbon transition, you need a plan, you need a map. And that's something that, for example, ADB has been very active on in Asia, in Asia and Pacific and is starting to work on now with its energy transition uh, mechanism. We're also developing knowledge reports on the just transition. And here I'd highlight the IADB's flagship report with, IL, with the ILO, talking about how we can combine greater employment opportunities with an exit from carbon intensive industries. We've also been looking at how do you promote economic diversification? How do you promote new, ac new economic activities? And if I can just talk briefly about EBRD's efforts in this area we and highlight one particular project which gives an example of this. Um, in 2020, we invested in the, um, the, we were an anchor investor in a bond issued by the coal heavy Polish utility Tauron. Now, if you told me two years ago that we would be investing in a, in a bond issued by a coal heavy company, I would have said no way. But the reason we were able to do this is because through this bond, Tauron committed to reduce its carbon intensity, to increase its renewable energy, but also worked with us to develop a reskilling program for workers in Silesia, which is an area particularly affected by, the exit, by an exit from coal. And that's a, for us a very practical example of the sorts of things that, as the MDBs, we want to be doing. We want to be using the combination of the capital markets, commercial pressures, but also the policy dialogue activity and the technical assistance that we bring. And then finally, as an MDB system, we're developing platforms and forums to support authorities. Um, and I'd highlight here the work that EIB and the World Bank are doing uh, in partnership with us on the initiative for coal regions in transition, focus on the West Balkans and Ukraine. And then, of course, the very extensive work that the European Union is doing, particularly with EIB, in rolling out just transition plans for EU member states. So if you can turn now to the, to the last slide. So this is very much the beginning. The, this is laying the foundations for the work to come. We want to move on from here to implement these principles and to start a conversation or continue a conversation with the many st stakeholders. But as I kept coming, keep coming back to, we want to turn this now into practical actions. We want to come back in, in a year's time and really be able to showcase practical interventions on the ground. This is a huge challenge. Uh, Chris mentioned earlier the experience of Northern England. That's not the only part of the world, but there are, and there are many others that have, that have been through this transition. We know that it is difficult, and we know that there, are, can be, there, there can be people left behind if we don't design it properly. It's a vital, important challenge, and I believe that these principles will set the foundation for a really sustainable response to that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, you set out so well the progress that the MDB Group uh, has made from that starting point and in the initial commitment in 2019 in this research and engagement process, exploring what a just transition means in different contexts to where the MDBs are at now uh, in terms of a clear set of principles to help guide MDB support for a just transition, a growing body of research and analytical tools, and of course, concrete projects and investments emerging. And, and the question is, what next? As you said, this is the beginning of a conversation. 
We have a fantastic panel with us today to offer their insights on the where next. Um, and if I can introduce them uh, one by one. Um, Irina Stavchuk, Deputy Minister of Environmental Protection and Resources of the Ukraine. Mark Yovan, Under Secretary of Finance, Ministry of Finance, Philippines. Anela Anger Kravi, Co Chair of the UNFCCC Katowice uh, Committee of Experts uh, on the Impacts of Implementation of Response Measures, also known as the KIC. And coming in to join the stage, <laughs> Mustafa Kamal Gay. Uh, Coordinator, Global Coordinator of the ILO Green Jobs Program. Welcome. Um, and joining us remotely, John Morrison, the CEO of the Institute uh, for Human Rights and Business. It's great to have you all with us. Um, and you will each have five minutes or so of opening remarks. Um, and for those of you on YouTube, uh, we want this to be as much of a conversation as possible. So please do get involved uh, and, and post your comments and suggestions uh, below the line and they'll be fed to us here in the studio. And you don't have to wait till the Q&A for that. You can start that coming as we're in discussion. Um, so Irina, if we, if we kick off with you, um, it was announced yesterday, obviously, that Ukraine is among the 28 new members of the Powering Past Coal Alliance and that Ukraine is committed to phasing out coal by 2035. So perhaps I can start by asking you that, you know, within this context, what does a just transition look like for Ukraine and how is the ministry planning for a just transition? Irina, over to you. So if you look at Ukraine over the last 30 years, it was gradual phase out of the coal. However, the government was not planning to do so. So after the collapse of Soviet Union with decline of economy, we really reduced consumption of coal from 166 million in 1990 to 29 million in 2020. So decline was tremendous. And it was happening, as I said, due to economy restructure, but also uh, in 2013, the war started with Russia on the east of Ukraine and more than half of the coal mines were left at that territory and also destroyed. So basically, all this time we could see how the phase out of coal should not happen because not all cities survived. And if you look at the eastern territories, the mines are destroyed with also huge pollution of the underground water. So it's going on out of control. Um, and all this time, I think, till 2019-18, Ukraine was planning actually to continue development of the coal sector. But over the last uh, two years, the situation changed dramatically in the policy and in the world. So we approved updated NDC this year with a much stronger target, with a vision that we phasing out coal gradually and substitute it with renewables and new balancing capacities. We are joining today Fast Coal Coalition to phase out um, coal in the electricity sector by 2035 and we'll do everything maybe to make it quicker. And uh, we also have remaining 30% of the coal use in our energy sector and at least 33 state coal mines which we have to close and which have to be done in a completely different way than it used to be before. So what we do, we we have developed already the strategy, the concept for the national program for just transition. We are cooperating with many partners for whom we are very helpful, MDBs, Germany, Poland, to actually get the best knowledge how to do it and to do it in a way which doesn't destroy the cities and people have a social life which, which they deserve. And um, we also develop multi-trust fund that we hope will support new businesses and diversification of economies, so really to help these regions to transition in a fair way. And, and you paint the picture of what a, you know, a structural challenge this is with 33 state coal mines to be phased out and this you know, long-term process of structural adjustments. Um, to, to what extent and how helpful is it in, you know, in terms of 
just transition planning and writing just transition considerations into Ukraine's NDC and long-term strategies. What has the process around that looked like and how useful is that long-term strategy and guidance to help convene different actors around? I think that's a key issue because first we have to really understand the most economically feasible ways of development but also with climate change goals in place. So that really helps to understand like how we transition, what kind of system we will have in 10 or 20 or 30 years. And on, in terms of just transition, I think the key is engagement with local authorities and uh, making sure that on the governmental level we reflect their needs, but also uh, interlink together to find out the best approaches. Because from the state perspective, we might not understand everything. And they locally also should both understand the state policy, but also feel that they are heard and uh, that they are not competitive situation to other regions is actually recognized and there are relevant programs and approaches developed to help them overcome the difficulties. So, so it really is a question of bridging these top-down and bottom-up challenges and supporting that discussion uh, as a central government, from a central government level. Um, Mark Yevon, if, if we can move on uh, to you. Uh, of course, the Philippines is starting from a very different uh, position uh, to, to Ukraine. The Philippines is obviously in the energy transition mechanism that was launched by ADB yesterday. And so I wonder if you could uh, kick us off by explaining what a just transition looks like in the Philippines context um, and how the Ministry of Finance is engaging with the challenges that it raises. Okay, <clears throat> so the Philippines has uh, essentially adopted uh, just transition principles in the area of climate change and fossil fuel reduction as early as 2008 when the, uh, when the renewable energy law was passed. Since then, subsequent legislation like the Climate Change Act in 2009, the Green Jobs Act of 2016, along with critical government policies like the adoption of the Paris Agreement, the recent submission of the updated NDC and the ILO application of Just Transition gui Guidelines in the Philippines in 2017 and the issuance of guidelines on green economy models in 2017 have put the issue of Just Transition front and center of uh, climate change discussions. MDBs have been strong supporters of uh, pushing the bounds of climate change legislation as both the ADB and AIIB have been quite active in policy-based lending uh, space in the uh, sorry the ADB and the World Bank have been quite active in the policy-based lending space in the last 20 years. Collaterally, uh, initiatives on just transition have been baked into legislation in order to ensure that an end-to-end -end and sustainable solution is in place. To further support groundbreaking policy changes, MDBs have also been enthusiastic in providing technical assistance in order to ensure sufficient knowledge support is given. Uh, it, the various laws cited earlier are proof of this strong collaboration between the MDBs and the Philippine government. In fact, to further accelerate the climate change agenda, the government is currently in negotiations with both the ADB and the EU on a new climate policy-based loan. So while the Philippines is a leader in the area of game-changing climate legislation, more work remains to be necessary in implementing just transition principles. MDBs, uh, while they have supported project financing in public utility vehicle mod modernization and energy transition, uh, <clears throat> in particular, ADB has provided financing for an e-trike project in 2012 or nine years ago to allow transition from gas guzzling and in inefficient tricycles plying urban areas. While the project itself has, has passed the ADB's environment, social, and gender safeguards, more work had to be done with the area of uh, in or in the area of sustainability, which means charging terminals, and deployment. Uh, in so far as uh, transitional justice is uh, concerned, this project will hopefully uh, bake into critical support towards development of proper deployment strategies, as well as a strategy to address transitional issues such as capacitating uh, uh, old bus drivers to new systems. More study should be pursued in so far as uh, institutional frameworks are concerned. Questions like how does the new system work under an existing regulatory framework or should legislation be introduced to efficiently carry out climate change projects and objectives. In closing, while positive leaps have been achieved in the area of climate policy and transitional justice, we should pursue initiatives at the project level to ensure that uh, project implementation is seamless 
and important issues on transitional justice and other allied objectives are met. Really important points about um, you know the development of just transition principles and legislating for a just transition and really setting that direction um, in law and, and making very very clear the long term pathway uh, towards a just transition. And I wonder, I mean, on the related point of planning and long term commitments, NDCs and long term strategies, the Philippines NDC obviously mentions social and climate justice as among the country's priorities. I wonder if you could say a few words about uh, the steps that have been taken so far by government to really support social dialogue and help deliver on that. So basically, uh, as this uh, discussion primarily deals with the uh, you know, energy transition from coal plants to, to uh, renewable energy, this is probably not as relevant in the Philippines versus uh, public utility vehicle modernization. So. Why is this? Because uh, the Philippines does not have a big uh, you know, coal mining industry. Essentially, we import our coal. So uh, we don't, uh, in terms of affected, uh, affected people, if we're going to transition out of uh, the coal sector, uh, we, we won't have uh, as big a challenge compared to coal mining countries. But the problem in our case is really the inefficient uh, public transport system. Uh, so the Philippine transport system essentially is very fragmented and lacks a, a, an overarching regulatory framework. So it's critical to, you know, to, to uh, have a good grasp of how the system has worked or has not worked in, in the past and try to figure out how to, you know, how to bake in or how to, to project in um, new technologies such as EVs into this system. So hopefully with that, we can also address uh, other uh, other ongoing problems like transitioning, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who drive buses, diesel buses, to people who drive elect, uh, electric buses. Yeah. Exactly, and and of course, it's not just a, an energy systems challenge, just transition. It's it's it runs through mobility uh, and through all areas of the economy. And this is a really important point to make, I think, about the structural yes. uh, nature of the challenge. Um, uh, on that note, Anella, I wonder if I can bring you in here as the, uh, the co-chair of the, the KIC uh, Committee of Experts. How does the joint work of the MDBs relate to uh, UNFCCC processes and particularly the work that the KIC is doing in understanding uh, and developing response measures uh, to, or sorry, mitigating the impacts of response measures, Anella? Yeah, thank you for having me here and um, inviting me to talk about KCI's work and what is KCI. KCI is the Katowice Committee of Experts on the Impact of Implementation of Response Measures. So in short, Katowice Committee on Impacts or KCI. So it's an expert body. It's the youngest constituted body under the UNFCCC. Uh, we were established in Katowice in 2000. 18. So we have met now five times um, and KCI was set up to support the work of the forum uh, of uh, response measures forum under the process. The forum is the agenda item that discusses the impacts of implementation of response measures. And what do we mean by response measures is um, climate change policies and measures that we take and that should lead us to, to net zero and stabilize the global temperature to 1.5 or you know, on below 2 degrees, pursuing 1.5 degrees. So it's a technical body supporting the negotiations really as KCI, this is what it does. KCI has got 14 members, uh, 12 members from different UN regions nominated then by the countries and they they are experts uh, in this area and then we have two members from relevant international organizations we currently have Kamal who sits next to me from ILO as one of our expert members from international organizations and then we have Jan Willem from um, EBRD as the second one um, serving on KCI KCI has, as the forum, has four main work areas. Uh, one of them is just transition of the workforce. 
um, and creation of decent jobs. Another one is economic diversification and transformation. The third one is to understand how we can assess the impacts of uh, climate policies and measures, uh, in other words, response measures. And the third one is facilitate, facilitation of tools and methods, how do we undertake those assessments. So in our work, it's really important that we exchange experiences and best practices among the KCI members, expert members, and then bring those into attention of the parties uh, under the forum negotiations. So we discuss, um, for example, how do we know that we need just transition? So what, we, so what are the methods we can use to analyze the policies that tell us that there are groups of people who actually might be suffering uh, uh, the consequences of implementation of climate policies. How do we know that? So we're discussing which tools we need. How do we need to find out? Uh, what we do we need to find out like what the impacts are? Then, then, we, then it takes us whether we need just transition, whether we need economic diversification. And there were the uh, MDBs are coming in. So once we know that we need the support to minimize the negative impacts and maximize the positive impacts of the response measures, then this is where the action starts. And MDBs are really important to, to support this. So that just make sure to make sure that no one is, is left behind. Thanks, Nella. And it's a it's an incredibly broad uh, program of work and detailed program of work. And I wonder from your perspective, where are the greatest barriers uh, or challenges to advancing this work and, and where can MDB support really help unlock those? KCI has um, agreed on a six-year work plan, so we're considering 11 different activities under that work plan. Um, and um, so they are taken up one by one and many of them include discussions on just transition and, and economic diversification. The challenge that at the moment is to really create the space of a technical, in-depth technical exchange. Mm -hmm. So we, we are a young considered body, we're still trying to find our feet and learning how to operate. So we very often get stuck into procedural discussions, as, as Kamal also can, can confirm here. And we don't get into in-depth technical discussions. We need to discuss just transition. Um, what do we mean by that? Um, exchange experiences from different countries. There are examples of where there are some of the regions in some countries, for example, in, in Denmark, um, there's like a case where the entire region has been through this transition already, and that is related to, to oil production, and they have developed the, the, that region to um, to renewable, to a support center for renewable energy, for wind energy. So there's, um, and there, there are other examples, good examples from other countries that we could share, learn from each other, but just creating this space, is, um, it takes time and effort. And just transition under the UNFCCC process is considered at response measures and at KCI. That's the space, but we're still trying to create it. And, and that is, um, um, at the moment, still challenging, if I may say so. And it's, it's so important because it is such detailed work and it can be really accelerated by knowledge sharing and, and peer exchange in this area. And this is certainly something that the KCI has facilitated and that the MDB group has, uh, has worked on uh, internally on, on, on sort of understanding lessons from other regions and other contexts. Uh, and of course, something that the ILO has done lots of work on. So maybe this is a good segue, uh, Mustafa, to you. The ILO guidelines uh, have really helped provide a common starting point uh, for, for work and collaboration on, the, on Just Transition. And of course, ILO's activities and policies run through many of these discussions, both at the country level and KCI and with the MDBs. So I wonder, how do you see uh, the, the challenges and the opportunities? How is ILO addressing, uh, addressing these at the, at the country level and at the policy level? And what is the role of MDBs in, in advancing this agenda and, and supporting that work? Mustafa, over to you. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity of being with Zaneva, who is uh, our co-chair in the KCI. Uh, the International Labour Office is working first uh, to help our tripartite constituents understand uh, 
the nature and scale of changes that could occur in the labor markets as countries pursue ambitious uh, climate policies. Uh, we have a good sense of um, the opportunity for employment creation and, and that is the good part of the story which is that altogether we are on a positive narrative meaning that um, the ecological transition can deliver uh, more and better jobs. However, there is going to be loss of employment, loss of income, uh, some level of social disruption and it is critical to manage that process of change so that as we say, no one is left behind to um, align with the 2030 agenda. Now, uh, beyond this research, it's a lot of policy advice to member states, uh, supporting them in projects um, and, uh, and operationalization. Now, I want to stop on the policy framework because it is important that we have a comprehensive set of policies that combine labor, social policy, with climate and environmental policies. And that is what the ILO guidelines for a just transition are, are meant to do, to help countries look at various areas of labor market policies, active, passive labor market policies, so that we ensure that we maximize the opportunities for job creation and, and to minimize the risk. Now, there is a critical element of financing uh, for a just transition and I think that is where uh, the MDBs uh, have an important role to play. Uh, a number of countries have been now starting to integrate decent work and just transition uh, in their short-term me measures, the, the nationally determined contribution, but also the longer-term plans for, for net zero. But obviously the challenge is how to enable that transition, how to reskill the workforce where it, it is needed, how to put in place mechanisms of social protection uh, where it is possible. And so we are therefore working a lot in partnership with, uh, with MDBs, with EBRD, uh, with IDB, and, um, uh, and other partners in that context. One, wonderful, Mustafa, and it's, it's great to hear you talk about some of the positive uh, opportunities, the upside of Just Transition as well, because I think sometimes when we talk about Just Transition, we focus very much on mitigating the negative impacts, and of course we know that the, the net jobs impact and the benefits associated with transition are huge, and, a, and an emphasis on equitable access to those opportunities and, and sustainable you know, green growth and good jobs is, is welcome alongside that focus on mitigating negative impacts. Um, in terms of, uh, you also raise a really important point about financing, uh, and of course this is a, a good uh, lead into our final speaker, uh, John Morrison, because of course there are huge questions here around sources of finance for just transition and the appropriate uh, balance of the public and the private sector, and, and what models of working together look like uh, on the ground. So. John, if I can bring you in here, your, your focus obviously is business um, and you're hosting discussions through this week on business and human rights uh, and the just transition. How do you see the role of business uh, and particularly of the private sector in supporting a just transition evolving? Um, and what can MDBs bring to that discussion? How can they support uh, a proactive role for the private sector? John, over. Thank you, Sean, and uh, I'm very pleased to be with everybody today. Um, I break it down into three parts, if that's okay. I mean, first of all, to congratulate the MDBs for having the principles that you've um, been launching this week. Um, you're ahead of many other parts of the finance sector, as, as I think you know. Um, the TCFD, for example, doesn't include any social risk dimension. Um, most of the private banks don't yet. The equator principles uh, are still moving in that direction. Export credit agencies have yet to embrace just transition, private equity, etc. So there are many other parts of the, the wider financial ecosystem that have still yet to put the issue of social risk and, and, and social outcomes in relation to, to climate action. So very much acknowledge the leadership that uh, you've all been taking here. Um, I think there's going to be, as we go forward, a quality control issue, therefore. Um, people are still using just transition in slightly different ways, in different contexts. And if we're talking about the private sector and how we engage with the high carbon emitters 
uh, of today, there needs to be some basis of, basis of accountability and trust in terms of who we work with, who we trust to, to meet the, uh, the, the goals of COP26. I, I, I found very interesting the recommendations of the Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions from the International Energy Agency that came out last week. And they don't look at people as just stakeholders. They look at people as active agents um, in terms of shaping their own transition destiny. I think whenever we think about workers and other communities uh, affected by these transitions, we need to think of them in that way. Uh, my second point then is some of the challenges of transitioning out um, of high carbon. I think we've already seen, and I'll, I'll, I'll take Colombia as an example, but there are other examples of businesses perhaps behaving in less responsible ways, um, returning high carbon assets back to the state, um, other businesses moving in and buying what might be deemed to be stranded assets um, for short term um, profit. Uh, workers do not fare well in those situations, uh, nor do the wider communities around these uh, coal mines and other high carbon assets. So this is, I would say, the brownfield challenge. Um, we need responsible businesses and financiers to remain in um, to ensure in the short term that the transitions are responsible and are right, human rights based. Um, leaving it to the marketplace on its own, uh, unfortunately at the moment, uh, creates uh, dumping and, and, and also the risk of, um, of people actually buying stranded assets um, for, for commercial gain. My final point is what I would call the sort of the transition in challenges, which we haven't covered here so much. Um, the, the renewable energy sector itself has its own impacts on, on indigenous peoples and other communities around the world, and those need to be brought into the equation. So too the unprecedented demand for copper, cobalt, lithium, rare earth metals, and nickel. Uh, we're gonna need more copper than has ever been dug out of the ground in human history between now and 2050. Um, this, the social responsibility of, 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 of this mining is very badly aligned with, with human rights. There's a lack of vertical integration. Uh, we might be moving from mass balance to um, greater traceability for some of these commodities, but at a time of um, greater competition between states and businesses to securitize their supply, and you'll see that some corporations are actually buying their own wind farms, buying their own mines, et cetera, in the Arctic and elsewhere to securitize their own um, uh, green uh, revolution, if you like. Those transition issues, transition in issues are also human rights issues, they're also worker issues. And we would say these have to also be factored into the, the just transition conversation too. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, incredibly important points on the, I think the distribution of uh, risk between the state uh, and the private sector and companies and, and how proactive management of, uh, of a just transition you know, and the recognition of just transition considerations in climate related risk and the, the, the disclosure of it through mechanisms like the TCFD for instance um, and proactive strategies to provide a pathway uh, for, for companies to support a just transition um, rather than loading that risk on the state and also of course there's a really important discussion to be had here around investor engagement and active ownership strategies and you can see a groundswell of interest among the private uh, sector, the investor groups in financing a just transition, um, and many other points which we can come back to in the discussion. Now, we have a few minutes left for uh, questions uh, and answers from the panel and, and some more discussion. I would like to reiterate uh, the, the call to those of you watching on YouTube to, to please uh, share comments, suggestions, uh, and we will pick them up in the studio. Um, we have one initial question um, come in, which is, is really around the analytical tools that can help MDBs assess and uh, remedy potential negative socio-economic impacts, for example, job losses uh, associated with instruments. 
I wonder if um, uh, Mustafa and Anella, I might come to you first from a sort of analytical perspective and then Irina and Mark um, from a country perspective in terms of what, what you see the issues and you know, what you need from MDBs in terms of addressing um, job losses. Uh, Mustafa, if I turn to you first. Well, first, of course, we, this is part of what the KCI is doing, but certainly Anella will speak on that. In terms of the IOS work, we have been engaging with a number of research organizations around the world. Uh, we have set up uh, a network called the Green Jobs Assessment Institutions Network. It's a group of research and policy institutions with uh, which we have produced a, a methodological guide uh, from statistical assessment to input-output tables and full economic models that would uh, be able to help member states uh, conduct such assessment, but also other organizations. And I want to say that we uh, launched a first uh, regional training hub, as we call it, in, in Africa. It was in 2019, and we did it in partnership uh, with the World Bank. Uh, we are, as we speak, planning to start a second regional hub for Francophone Africa at the end of November. Uh, where we are engaging with the um, African Development Bank and we've been working with IDB on, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So essentially the, the objective is to have tools that policy institutions in the countries uh, can themselves use but, but other actors as well, uh, MDBs, you know, the ones that I mentioned, the, the African Bank, um, IDB and uh, Asian bank could, could use for, I mean, and, and obviously for this matter, EBRD, you know, where the IWA has been working with EBRD already a lot in looking at the employment impact of infrastructure projects in, in northern Africa. So that is the kind of tools we, we are uh, developing and working with, with partners. But as I said, the objective is to enable institutional capacity within the country so that you know, in the Philippines where we had the opportunity to engage with the Senate on the Green Jobs Act that we have institutions able to conduct these assessments and, and inform national policies. And, and it comes back to knowledge sharing and capacity building and of course much of this work in terms of the analytical work, understanding the distributional impacts of a just transition is going on within the European Commission, within the MDBs, but how you share that that, that knowledge and make sure that country stakeholders are equipped with the same tools and can really engage uh, and use that information and plan and build policy on it is a really, really critical question. Um, Anella, did you, did you want to come in here? Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, so K KCI has already completed an activity and so two activities actually, looking at the methods and tools, how does the impacts, uh, 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 the impacts of implementation of response measures. And we, what we look, we're looking at how to assess the socioeconomic impacts, but also um, impacts on gender, impacts on um, uh, social justice, um, so we, we have completed a, on the KCI a database of available tools. Uh, also looking uh, the d uh, also looking at the data availability that is needed for those tools. Uh, the database is available on the website. We have completed a technical paper describing how to assess the impacts um, of imp of the implementation of response measures. Uh, we have also during the work we have also um, highlighted the importance of using qualitative tools, not just quantitative tools, because for just transition some of the qualitative tools are very important, so that you you don't have models you can assess the impacts on gender or different social or ethnic groups or local communities, indigenous peoples, there where the qualitative methods are coming in. So we have shared experiences on that. We have made uh, some of the tools that are available known. We also very much appreciate uh, the work programs on, on training and training programs that are going on on different assessment methods uh, uh, and using them uh, at ILO and at the UN Economic Committees in, in Africa and uh, in Latin America. So we can see, we have, during the work, we have seen that there are actually already ongoing um, training workshops, not knowledge sharing, but we need more of that. And also the importance of having country-based studies, really. That not just like the consultants from uh, one country 
um, conducts a study that, that is relevant to other uh, country without even having the stakeholder input from that particular country or checking whether the data they're using is actually correct. Um. Yeah, and, and this brings us to um, the, the distinction between distributional justice and procedural justice. And of course, it's, it's so important that this sort of analysis and these tools are developed with meaningful stakeholder engagement and, and have a you know, country voice and a, and a country led. And there's a groundswell of um, information being brought together by, by different institutions. Uh, and of course, the MDBs are busy putting together their case studies and experience uh, in a sort of resource library of um, just transition uh, tools and instruments and case studies but there are also other platforms out there some of which you've you've just mentioned databases that you've just mentioned and also the work of the SIFS and CSIS and their just transition initiative um, and it's how to really leverage all of this information and build that country conversation that is such an important uh, and urgent question um, we have another question that's come in on uh, just transition in the coal oil and, oil and gas sectors always seem to focus on reinventing coal regions into renewable regions. Um, however, this is not always feasible and the renewable industry is not always job intensive enough. How can other sectors be addressed? And I'm, I'm gonna add to that, how can other drivers of um, sustainable development be brought into the conversation um, uh, to help uh, mitigate uh, some of the more negative impacts? Irina and Mark, maybe I can turn to you for some uh, responses on that uh, before we wrap up. Irina. Oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, uh, I mentioned it earlier that in the case of uh, coal, if your if your country is not you know not a uh, big coal mining company, essentially, the the offshoot of uh, the offshoot of uh, moving towards uh, you know uh, uh, renewable energy is not that big of a problem compared to if your country is a you know big coal mining uh, big coal producer and at the same time. You're also a uh, big coal user, so in 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 the case of the Philippines, there's basically one only one major uh, coal produce uh, coal mining entity, which also has a coal plant. Uh, essentially, uh, by virtue of this, the affected peoples would not be very big. So transitioning them towards towards uh, uh, renewable uh, you know uh, towards uh, renewable energy jobs or jobs in the renewable energy sector wouldn't be that uh, big of a problem, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Irina. Yeah, I fully agree that it cannot be only renewable energy because it doesn't fit necessarily. And it is indeed the key question for the transition of this region is coming up with completely new creative ideas of new industries, new businesses. And in case of Ukraine, it's even more complicated because these regions are very close to the line of the war. So it really uh, additional effort to attract people, to attract businesses, and to like to really make them uh, willing to invest and work in that region. So in this case, I think uh, there are two issues that uh, MDBs can help. One is uh, experience sharing and collecting the best examples all over the world, what could be done, what kind of businesses can work there. And secondly, is coming up with good financial systems. So uh, what the previous speakers were addressing, so how we combine the state incentives and, I don't know, discounts and financial system for, which attracts private investment and really helps them to develop. So these examples, I think, are critical. And as a Ministry of Environment, we are working on NDC implementation. We try to think about, in the same directive, about the whole country. Here we have like more focused coal transition, but that's basically one of the very important questions, like how to combine public and private and what kind of financial instruments have to be developed in countries to enable that. Precisely. It really is a regional development question and an economic restructuring question, isn't it? And so we have about a minute left before we turn to um, our closing remarks. I, I want to just ask one sort of quick fire question uh, in terms of, you know, this is really the, the COP that just transition as a topic really landed. What are your expectations or what would you like to see ahead of COP27 uh, on, on just transition? And uh, John, I mean, if you want to come in on this as you haven't <laughs> responded on the last round, please do. Yeah, I think clarity about what we're talking about, um, bringing, if we're bringing other stakeholders, governments, mayors, um, business into the equation, 
we need to bring the supply and the demand side. Um, it's great that there are 200 companies in the world that have signed this climate pledge, um, Amazon, Microsoft, the big energy users. There's no social component to the climate pledge whatsoever at the moment. There's no just transition in there. So I think there are some dots we can join up. Um, but I really hope that uh, yeah, the just transition and the, the whole issue of the social impact of climate action becomes a bigger and bigger part of future COPs. And uh, we, 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 we inject this quality control issue so that uh, there are no free riders, there's no greenwashing, whether you're a government or whether you're a business or a community organization, everybody's focused in the same direction. But I, but I agree, it's very refreshing to, to hear people talking about it, at least to some extent, uh, to this week in Glasgow. Thanks, John. So one really clear answer, bringing together the supply side and the, and the demand side of the discussion. Um, Anello, if I, if I turn to you. I think creating space for in-depth discussions and just transition, that also includes stakeholders, including MDB, MDBs, and very glad to see the just transition principles of MDBs launched. They're very important, the five principles that we heard about today. Thank you. Mustafa. Well, I think it would be very positive if we get just transition reflected in the key COP outcomes. There are discussions in the Improved Forum and the KCI. However, the Paris Agreement doesn't confine just transition to uh, response measures. It has to be in Article 6 and hopefully in the Glasgow Declaration. Uh, action taking place today, the Just Transition Political Declaration under the UK COP presidency was launched and we see partnerships like the one launched between the EU, Germany, France, uh, the US and the government of South Africa with $8.5 billion for a just energy transition. So things like that and finally the principles that the MDBs have uh, put forward because that financing uh, component is going to be critical for success. Wonderful. Thank you, Mustafa. And Mark? Yeah, so <clears throat> more than any previous COP, this COP focuses on climate finance essentially. And the mobilization of uh, uh, finance from the MDBs is quite critical. So I think uh, the role of MDBs is increased in this particular COP. And hopefully, uh, these MDBs can be a channel by which uh, you know, we can bake in uh, uh, just transition principles into projects in individual countries. Thank you. Thanks. And Irina? Yeah, and I would say keeping the momentum of the discussions that are already happening and all the developments so that in the future we have even more understanding and more experience exchange and better vision for financial instruments, how we deliver that. Brilliant. So a really clear uh, wish list uh, for the coming year ahead on, on just transition an ongoing uh, discussion, I think, with the MDBs and, and all of the other various actors represented on the panel here today, but everyone else who has been involved in the process and for many of you watching on YouTube. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you all very much for joining us today. And I'm now going to hand over to Bam Bam Susantone, um, the Vice President of Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development at the Asian Development Bank for our closing remarks. Thank you. Distinguished delegates and colleagues here in Glasgow, participants joining from all over the world, ladies and gentlemen, we are nearing the end of an hour which we dedicated to discussing a just transitions toward a low emissions and climate resilient future. We, as multilateral development banks, cannot shy away from our responsibility toward our countries on this important agenda. We have heard from governments, partner organizations, and civil society representatives on their insights into how we can pursue the transitions to resilient and low emission economies while leaving no one behind. This perspective have highlighted the need for a collaborative inclusive and multi-dimensional approach. The pandemic has brought an unprecedented global economic and health crisis, exposing structural weaknesses in all economies and magnifying their impact to the workers, the poor and the vulnerable groups. We have seen unemployment rates go up in both developed and developing countries. Limited mobility and access to basic services affected all levels and sectors of society. 
what we can already tell from this pandemic experience is that these same social groups are at the risk of being impacted most by the cost of climate actions on the one hand. On the other hand, their equitable share of the benefit is far from guaranteed. Limited global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius will need rapid and large scale actions. There is no doubt about that. The question is, is how to put just transitions at the core of our planning and policy making and protect the most vulnerable. One of the keys to answering this question lies in strong collaborations among the MDBs. Through the five MDB just transition high level principles presented today, we articulated a common understanding of the aims, approach, scope, skill, outcomes, and processes associated with a just transition. Implementing these principles in our work, we lay the foundation for consistency, credibility, and transparency in MDB's efforts. I would like to assure you that just transition is well aligned with ADB strategy 2030 and its operational priorities. They include addressing remaining poverty and reducing inequalities, accelerating progress in gender equality, tackling climate change, building climate and disaster resilience, and enhancing environmental sustainability, and strengthening governance and institutional capacity. ADB has also committed to just transition in our new energy policy that was approved only last month. In addition, just transition is at the center of the energy transition mechanism that we announced this week here in Glasgow. ADB will be developing this market-based mechanism for the early retirement of coal-fired power plants. We are also supporting and consulting with countries in the Asia and Pacific regions to better address the challenges and opportunities they face in pursuing a just transition. This includes looking at the impacts of climate actions in key economic sectors beyond energy, such as agriculture, fisheries, forestry, tourism, transport, and waste management. As we close these sessions, it is my sincere hope that we all elevate the importance of incorporating just transition into designing and implementing more ambitious climate actions. As today's discussion have made clear, all MDBs are ready to support the countries through policy advice, technical assistance, and financing. We are committed to ensuring that the benefits of the low carbon and resilience transition are shared by all. I thank all our panelists today for joining this important discussions. It has been a great opportunity for ADB to appreciate our fellow MDBs for the joint efforts on just transition so far. I look forward to further collaboration in the future, and I wish everyone a successful COP26. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so all that remains is for me to say thank you very much to the MDB Paris Alignment Working Group and to our speakers from EIB, EBRD and ADB today for putting this important issue on the agenda at COP. Thank you to our fantastic panel of speakers for joining us uh, and having such an interesting discussion. Uh, and thank you to all of you for watching. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.